phenomena of cancer is ingrained in our culture, so much so that movies and television series are embedded in that experience. I'm sorry. I, I think I was next in line. Listen, I'm a little pressed for time. Do you mind if I just pay for my stuff real quick and be on my way? I'm a little pressed for time, too. I have cancer. And maybe it's in that they connect with our fear and even fantasy on the topic that those productions often enjoy soaring success. We had a good run. But taking our cultural idea of cancer, which includes how we get it, how we survive it, and what our chances are of surviving it, just how complete is that picture? Well, no matter what, I guarantee in listening to today's guest that that picture for you will broaden. His successes in treating cancer patients lie at the intersect of holistic medicine and conventional medicine to include nutrition, repurposed medicines, and mind-body approaches. What roles do nutrient deficiency, nutrient excess, like having too much copper, and our own fear play in cancer? And what tried and tested methods have turned them around? Welcome to Vital Signs, where we learn how to get healthier from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brendan Fallon. Dr. McKee, welcome back to Vital Signs. Thank you, Brendan. Great to be here again. I know that over your decades of treating cancer, you've applied a, a diverse array of different treatments that would come under the banner of functional medicine, integrative medicine, and we're going to look at different aspects of that today. To start with, cancer is such an ominous, foreboding phenomenon. How could something so simple as a supplement, basically replenishing nutrients to the body, really have effectiveness against that? So the reason that it's so important to get organically grown food or grow it yourself or get it from, you know, a local farmer's market where they're composting the soil, even with the best quality foods today, the soil of the earth has been subjected to many things that have caused toxins to be in the soil and have also depleted nutrients from the soil. And since World War II, there's been a move away from composting and the introduction of what we call NPK fertilizer, which stands for nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And that actually came from, there was a lot of leftover explosive materials, which contain those, several of those minerals, uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, and they were repurposed for fertilizing. So those three minerals are required for plants to grow. But over time, the trace minerals, which are we know to be important in many aspects of health, but specifically cancer prevention, such as selenium and chromium and zinc and copper, all the, the trace minerals, silicon, molybdenum, manganese, these have all been depleted from the soil because they're just putting these three minerals in. Now, food that is grown the old way, you know, a hundred years ago, there was no such thing as organic food. All food was organic. It was all grown with composting and there were no pesticides. There were no fungicides. There was not mega crops. My grandfather was a farmer in Ohio and he had a hundred acres and he was growing monoculture corn, but he was still getting manure from the slaughterhouses and spreading that on his fields in addition to starting to use the, the new fertilizers that were coming in. But things have changed so dramatically, and this is a very complex web of toxicity, and the loss of micronutrients from the diet magnifies the toxicity. Uh, Dr. Bruce Ames has done a lot of research. One of the things that he showed is that when micronutrients are in short supply, it dramatically enhances the toxicity of the environmental contaminants. Just nutritional deficiencies of micronutrients, these are not the big ones like potassium and magnesium, these are the little ones like chromium and selenium and molybdenum, manganese, zinc, copper. When these are in short supply, mutations occur in DNA spontaneously very similar to being exposed to radiation. So we're, we're more susceptible to environmental toxins if we're low on these nutrients. We're more vulnerable exactly. to environmental toxins. Exactly. It magnifies the environmental toxicity. So when someone presents with cancer, about 5% of cancers can be ascribed to inherited genetic factors. That if you inherit a gene for a mutation of a gene called P53, 
It's called Lee from any syndrome. The incidence of four or five different cancers is dramatically higher. However, what we've learned in the last 20 years and, and at an accelerating rate is that epigenetics is a process that through careful application of nutrition, mind-body therapies, and detoxification, meaning practices that can help the body shed itself of um, things like heavy metals and many environmental chemicals, that this can result in a dramatically enhanced ability to heal, even in people who've inherited genes that put them at risk for serious diseases like cancer. So not everybody who inherits a mutated P53 that has Levromini syndrome gets cancer. And that was always kind of puzzling, but now we're starting to understand that if people either accidentally or purposefully stay better nourished, stay less stressed, stay more physically active, that this causes a rewriting of the genes, which is what we call epigenetics. So it can cause the body to use new gene variants and not touch the deadly genes that were inherited. So the old idea that genetics is destiny is definitely out the window. And epigenetics presents a tremendous, uh, the phenomenon of epi our scientific understanding of epigenetics produces a tremendous hopefulness for what we can do to achieve and maintain health as we age and, and go through life. Perhaps you or someone close to you has come through cancer or is currently living with it. If so, I especially invite you to share your experience here. How has treatment been? Have any natural or holistic treatments been helpful? You can go to epochtv.com and find vital signs in the talk shows tab to leave your comments. Also, I invite you to share this video with at least one friend or family member. It helps bring subscribers to the channel, which makes my boss happy and supports me to do more and more shows. And it all starts with that share arrow just below. With the right combination of li lifestyle factors of, of diet and, and mindset, you can effectively negate your, your cancer potential. Right. And also another thing that Ames's work and others have shown is that higher levels of certain nutrients can offset environmental toxicity. Now, you don't want that. You can definitely get too much copper. You can get too much zinc. You can get too much of vitamin D and vitamin A. But our current uh, normal, quote unquote, ranges for vitamin D are based on a vitamin D deficient population. Our ancestors lived outside in the sun. They didn't wear a lot of clothing. And the sun does many things, but one of them is that the UVB rays, the ones that can cause sunburn if you don't have enough melanin in your body. And as you go farther into the, the subtropics and the tropics, the skins become darker because that's the natural protection against UVB. And so dark-skinned people who move to a northern climate where the sun is much less intense and has much less UVA and UVB, UVB being the vitamin D, important ones, have particularly low levels of vitamin D. So if you look at lifeguards in the summer who don't use sunscreen, and they don't need sunscreen after they've developed a good tan, and many don't use it, Sunscreen will negate the, uh, it'll block the absorption of the ultraviolet rays that cause the conversion of the cholesterol metabolite that gets converted into vitamin D. If you look at the levels of lifeguards in San Diego at the end of the summer, their levels are two to two and a half times what's considered normal. Like anywhere up to 30 nanograms is considered the lower limit of normal. So with cancer patients, I always seek to have their serum vitamin D level between 60 and 80 nanograms per mil. The example you were giving me before about the lifeguards, in a nutshell, what is the solution to getting sun and also avoiding melanoma, avoiding skin cancers? Well, avoid sunburn. That's the main, the main thing. It's not sun, it's sunburn that leads to melanoma. So if you're, you know, I've maybe two or three sunburns in my life my skin 
tans easily and well. I worked as a lifeguard in the summers when I was young for my summer jobs uh, when I was in college. However, redheads and um, people who are very blonde and blue-eyed and fair, they have to go very slowly into how much sun their skin will tolerate. But the major issue is that most people are going to work every day and they're inside all the time. You know, they may be outside on the weekends, but it's not enough exposure. So most people need to supplement vitamin D to get the levels that our ancestors carried and that, you know, lifeguards carry that don't use um, sunscreen. 30 nanograms per mil is considered normal vitamin D by most doctors. But as, as I said, our normal ranges are based on a vitamin D deficient population because we all live in most of the time indoors. So our ancestors would store up vitamin D in the summer and late fall, and then they would store that. It's a fat soluble vitamin. They'd store it in their fat and they would release it over the winter months as needed. So it would get them through the winter and then they would uh, pick up again. So we do, don't have that natural cycle anymore. And so I generally depend on supplementation for myself and for my patients. 